For years, I have been asking for the iPad Pro to get pro features like windowed applications, full support for external monitors, mouse and keyboard support, and pro apps like Final Cut Pro. And after all these years, they actually did it. They gave me almost every pro feature I have asked for, but at the same time, Apple also gave us such a massive upgrade to the new MacBook Pro lineup that I think many of us kind of started to write off the iPad Pro as a viable laptop replacement. However, I'm here to take a second look at the age-old debate of should you get an iPad Pro or a MacBook Pro, and more importantly, which one do I use? Now, the iPad Pro is of course great on its own, but one of its key strengths is its versatility, and you can expand that versatility even further thanks to our friends at ESR with their new line of cases. And yes, this isn't hype. I am telling you that this shift magnetic case from ESR will literally change the way you use your iPad and expand its versatility. And this case is so cool. It's basically a two-part case where this thinner layer uh, attaches to the iPad and then features a strong magnet on the back. And then that can actually magnetically attach to the secondary, more protective case with an ultra-stable rock-solid design that even works on your lap. And this case can be configured in multiple ways, including raising the screen of the iPad Pro on top of the case, connecting it magnetically for a more natural and comfortable position to use it in, which is great for your posture. Or you can even rotate the iPad Pro to portrait mode for a better browsing or reading experience or for a more natural eye level view during video calls. But hands down, the coolest thing about this case is those strong magnets, which means you can attach it to any magnetic surface. So I can literally put this thing on my fridge, watch videos while I'm cooking, or easily look up steps in a recipe. Recipe. This case is so innovative, it even won a Red Dot Design Award for 2023. Of course, much like the tone of this video, we know not everything is a one-size-fits-all solution, so make sure you check out ESR's Rebound Hybrid case, which also features a detachable magnetic cover, dual protection, and can be used in that portrait stand mode. Magnets really do make everything better. To get these cases, make sure you check out the link in the description, and thank you to ESR for sponsoring this video. Now, that case was just one example of how the iPad Pro can transform itself over and over again. It's one thing that I always appreciate about the iPad. It's a slab of glass that can take on so many different roles, whereas the MacBook Pro is obviously a much more limiting form factor because you can't remove the bottom keyboard area, right? Like it comes like this, you open it up and you use it. With the iPad, you can transform it in multiple ways. So if you wanna use it as just a tablet, well, no problem. But if you wanna buy accessories for it to expand its capabilities, well, you can with something like the Magic Keyboard for a laptop-like setup. Or if you wanna do drawing, you know, if you're an artist, you can get an Apple Pencil too. Or hey, you can even now connect it pretty reliably to an external display with a mouse and keyboard setup. There's even more examples of just how flexible and versatile the iPad Pro is as a device. So I really do have to give it credit for its versatility here. Of course, depending on how versatile you want to make your iPad Pro, the cost of all this stuff does start to add up. Sure, when you first take a look at the 12.9 inch iPad Pro and the 14 inch MacBook Pro, it clearly looks like this MacBook Pro is going to be more expensive than the iPad Pro by like $500. However, let's say you want to add on Apple's Magic Keyboard accessory for a more laptop-like experience. Well, that quickly adds another $350 onto the price tag. And then let's say you want to do some drawing with the Apple Pencil. Well. That's another $130 to the price tag for this setup, basically bringing this iPad Pro configuration to the same exact starting price as this 14-inch M3 MacBook Pro. Now, you might think that's a fair trade-off for the amount of versatility you can get on this iPad Pro, but I actually think from a value perspective, the iPad Pro is worse than the MacBook Pro because one thing I failed to mention is that for the starting configuration of this iPad Pro, it only comes with 128 gigabytes of starting storage, which I don't have to tell you is pretty low for a main computing device. In fact, if you want to bump up to the next storage tier at 256 gigabytes, you're actually going to have a more expensive product than the MacBook Pro, and that storage starts at 512 gigabytes. So that's still double what you get on the iPad Pro. So if you wanna get an exact match in specs for storage between these devices, that actually takes the iPad Pro all the way up to $1,400 without any additional accessories. And when you add those iPad Pro accessories, the price tag of the iPad Pro is actually about $300 more than the MacBook Pro. And that's pretty shocking. Even if you say 
you drop something like the Apple Pencil from this equation, you're still looking at an iPad Pro with a laptop-like setup with the Magic Keyboard, about $150 premium over the 14-inch MacBook Pro. So while you may think the MacBook Pro is going to be more expensive, unless you're using the iPad Pro just as a tablet, it is very likely you'll be spending about the same or even more money on an iPad Pro than you would for a full MacBook Pro. Of course, let's not boil this down to just a boring price comparison. You could have done that yourself by looking at Apple's website. You don't need me for that, right? Why would the iPad Pro or the MacBook Pro be a better choice for you? There's a lot of different things here, right? And one of those is portability. The iPad Pro is more portable than this 14-inch MacBook Pro. Number one, in tablet mode, it weighs just 1.5 pounds compared to the 3.4 pounds on the MacBook Pro. Even with the Magic Keyboard case, it weighs 2.9 pounds and it's overall a smaller package than the MacBook Pro, so it does make it slightly more portable. But listen, I'm a reasonable person. I know that when you look at these specs, uh, the weight or size difference isn't that big and, and it may not take up that much more space in a bag or something like that, but I kind of can't overstate just how futuristic the iPad Pro still feels when you're just using it in tablet mode. This device is so slim, so sleek, and it's more comfortable and easier to use in those more casual situations when you're lounging around than something like the MacBook Pro. I think it's crazy that there's an M2 chip inside of this incredibly slim body. This thing literally, well, not literally because this does have the M3 chip in it, but basically it has the power of a Mac in your hands. And yeah, that is such an impressive feat to me. Still, you can't take for granted just how much more the MacBook Pro has going for it when it comes to connectivity. The iPad Pro only has one Thunderbolt USB-C port and an extra USB-C port just for charging on the Magic Keyboard case. But the MacBook Pro comes with a dedicated MagSafe charging port, two Thunderbolt USB-C ports, an SD card slot, and an HDMI port. And all that extra space in the MacBook Pro leads to an even bigger battery, which gives you 22 hours of battery life. It is insane. While the iPad Pro gets about 10 hours of battery life, and honestly, at this point, I feel like the iPad Pro in standby mode drains so much faster than my MacBook Pro. I can come back to my MacBook Pro after not using it for a while and still find the battery at a very nice percentage. And sometimes I don't use my iPad Pro for a week. It's connected to the keyboard. I come back to use it and the battery is dead. So when you go for that traditional form factor, you're gaining a lot here, right? Like the iPad Pro doesn't even have a headphone jack and this MacBook Pro does. Now, one interesting difference between both devices is the cameras. And there's some really interesting trade-offs here because the front facing camera on the iPad Pro has Apple's center stage feature that can move around and keep the user in the frame. It's a really cool feature, but it actually does have a disadvantage because it has to crop in on the user and it does lose resolution and detail compared to the fixed 1080p camera on the MacBook Pro. So the MacBook, Pro camera isn't as cool on the front facing camera, but it is better quality. But the MacBook Pro also loses out on the strength of the true depth system in the front camera on the iPad Pro because you have to use the Touch ID sensor to unlock your Mac, whereas the iPad Pro comes with the full Face ID sensor and I just find Face ID uh, easier to use, more effortless to use to unlock your iPad, whether that's in tablet mode or if it's propped up uh, on a keyboard case. On top of that, it also has two rear cameras, a wide angle and an ultra wide angle lens, which actually has pretty good quality for taking pictures and video with, and that's something you can't even do on the MacBook Pro. And it even has a LiDAR scanner. So if you are utilizing you know, augmented reality or 3D modeling applications, that's actually a pretty nice thing to have. Now, while connectivity and form factor may be different, uh, the technological differences between the iPad Pro and MacBook Pro share a lot of similarities. And where they have probably the most similarities besides the chip is with the screen technology. Both feature an ultra smooth 120 Hertz ProMotion display, and it's a mini LED display with a million to one contrast ratio. So it features very accurate colors and deep black levels. And on top of that, the screens can both get very bright up to 1600 nits for SDR brightness, but then up to 1000 nits for full screen brightness for HDR content and up to 1600 nits of peak brightness uh, for you know certain areas on the screen during HDR content playback. Both displays look absolutely fantastic and they're some of the best displays in the entire laptop or tablet industry. And quite frankly, some of the best displays, period. However, both displays carry 
two unique advantages to them. The most obvious one is size. The 14-inch MacBook Pro display is just bigger, so it's naturally just a better display if you want to multitask, uh, watch content on it, or just have a bigger display for your apps. And when it comes to speakers, even though the 12.9-inch iPad Pro honestly sounds pretty great, especially for a tablet, it can't match the extra bass and clarity offered by the MacBook Pro speakers. Still, we're talking about the screens here, right? The 12.9-inch iPad Pro screen size is, it's good, right? Like, it's a pretty good and very comfortable screen size to use, especially for uh, the tablet-optimized apps. However, there's one advantage that the iPad Pro has that you can never do on a Mac. You can touch it. Now, some people don't need or want a touch screen on a laptop, especially if you're used to working with a trackpad and keyboard, or you don't have any applications that can really take advantage of the touch screen, you probably won't care on the Mac. But there are so many applications on the iPad Pro that just really aren't possible on the Mac display, or there's just a better experience because you have a touch screen user interface. Some apps, I think, are obviously things like drawing applications, a much better experience on the iPad Pro. Even uh, photo editing, if you're using certain brushes, the Apple Pencil is really nice to do that with too. Uh, music applications with customizable user interfaces, DJ apps, or even something as simple as just handwriting or drawing notes in the Notes app is a better experience on the iPad. But in the past, one of my biggest gripes about the iPad Pro was the lack of pro-level applications. However, something has changed since the last time I took a look at the iPad and MacBook in a head-to-head -head comparison, and that is that Apple finally brought their own pro-level applications, Final Cut Pro and Logic Pro, over to the iPad Pro. So now the iPad can finally go head-to-head -head with the Mac. Sort of. Listen, I, I think there's some strengths going for Final Cut Pro on the iPad. It's pretty easy to use. It has a good touch user interface, and it even works well with keyboard and mouse controls. However, it is not a full replacement for Final Cut Pro on the Mac because it's still missing a lot of pro-level tools and features. And there's some pretty big missing features like advanced color grading or third-party plugins and the inability to take a Mac Final Cut Pro project and then edit it on the iPad Pro because you can take an iPad Pro project and edit it on the Mac. So not having that round tripping kind of stinks for the iPad, right? And there's some pretty big misses here that make this version still not feel like a complete full replacement uh, compared to the Mac version. Yes, some other third-party apps like Logic I think are better fits for the iPad Pro, and there are some other great video editor options out there like DaVinci Resolve, but all in all, I think the Mac has had just so many years to build up these applications uh, that they're just, they just run better, they feature more things, and they have broader support for third-party plugins. Then there's also just the ease of use in how these systems work between these applications. The iPad has a more tied-down user experience. Sure, you can access the Files app, but it really doesn't compare to the file system on macOS. It also means importing photos, videos, music, and other assets, in my opinion, is less of a hassle to do on the Mac. Now, in previous years, this is the part where I would start to mention iPadOS has limited multitasking features compared to macOS, and it doesn't support windowing. But the iPad has received some significant upgrades since the last time I did a Versus video, and one of those is windowed applications. This comes with a new feature called Stage Manager, which has already received some new tweaks in the recent iPadOS 17 release to give you more freedom when managing windows, allowing you to place and overlap them more to your liking. Stage Manager on the iPad is still limited to just four applications being on the screen at once, so it's not complete window management freedom like you can get on macOS where you can kind of clutter up the display as much as you like, but on the 12.9 inch iPad Pro display, four windows is about the max amount of windows I would want open on the display at one time, so that's actually quite fine. However, like I mentioned before, you can actually connect the iPad Pro easily to a USB-C monitor, which then extends your iPad to a huge display. And then with a trackpad or a mouse and a keyboard, uh, you can actually get the most direct Mac-like experience on your iPad Pro. Of course, if you still want to use your iPad with the more simple multitasking system with its split view, uh, you can do that. And if you still just want to use one app at a time in full screen mode, of course, you can do that too. And I, I do feel like that is a much simpler and easier way for most people to use these devices because the interface is almost exactly the same as your smartphone. And let's face it, that's what most people use as their primary computing device. Now, while macOS does get this new stage manager feature if you want to use it, nothing beats the regular macOS window management for an unlimited number of applications on the display. There's also some system level things for multitasking that 
Macs just handle better than iPads and they're not really talked about a lot. For example, with the iPad, you can basically just have one audio source at a time. Whereas with the Mac, you can have multiple audio sources. So let's say if you were to play a YouTube video, uh, some of your music, a podcast, they can all play at the same time on the Mac. Whereas on the iPad, uh, it would have to just choose one. And then if you went to go play something else, well, then it would play that and stop the other thing. Now you might think, okay, I, I don't want that. I don't wanna play and listen to multiple audio sources at once. And yeah, most of the time you don't, but let's say you want to listen to music while you're editing a video. Well, on the iPad Pro, you can't do that. Or if you're listening to a podcast or you're scrolling through Twitter on your iPad, sometimes an auto playing video can hijack your iPad's audio and completely stop what you're listening to, completely ruining the vibes. The vibes are completely ruined and I hate that. No, on the Mac, if that video starts playing, you can just quickly mute it and it doesn't stop your podcast or your music or anything like that. Small things like that really impact the user experience. So ultimately, I find the Mac a more powerful and more flexible way to multitask, but I also acknowledge that for some users, it may be a steeper learning curve and you may prefer uh, the way that the iPad does it. Okay, we talked about a lot of differences between these devices, but let's talk about something that might actually be pretty similar, performance. Yeah, you might not have guessed that, but both of these devices are packing Apple's regular M series chips. Despite it being an older chip, it still compares really favorably to the M3. Opening apps, multitasking, scrolling, watching videos, spreadsheets, word processing, light photo and video editing, even gaming. The iPad Pro can run Resident Evil Village. It's a very competent chip. Uh, the performance for both of these machines are great. But I did kind of think it would be fun to do a little export test considering this is really the first time I can actually compare a direct video export using Final Cut Pro on both systems to see if there is a big speed advantage uh, on the MacBook Pro. Now, I'm not sure if the settings match up perfectly here, but I did my best exporting a 10 minute and 30 second 4K video clip uh, to H.264 on both the Mac and the iPad Pro. And I was shocked when the results finally happened because it was basically a tie in exporting speed, despite the fact that the iPad Pro is on an older chip and doesn't have any active cooling fan inside of it. So yeah, that's a shock. Now, like I have demonstrated in videos before, all Apple Silicon chips are very, very optimized for video editing workflows because of their dedicated media engines. And this was honestly a very simple export of just a 10 minute, 30 second clip. There were no effects or anything like that. So. You know, if I did a longer video and, you know, maybe there was more chance for the iPad to thermal throttle, I kind of fully expect that the M3 MacBook Pro would be more powerful. But again, um, these are kind of, even though it's both Final Cut Pro on both systems, I'm sure these apps are architected in different ways where, uh, you know, maybe it takes advantage of the iPad in a certain way or the Mac a certain way. Anyway, what I'm trying to say here is that even though you think there might be like a huge performance difference, uh, you know, going for a MacBook Pro and seven iPad Pro, uh, that might simply just not be the case. The way these systems work is pretty different. Now, will an updated M3 iPad Pro be faster? Yeah, of course it will. And will a MacBook Pro uh, be faster for longer work sessions where it has a chance to kind of thermally throttle? Yeah, of course it's gonna be faster. It has a fan to cool that chip. But I think the main point I'm trying to illustrate here is that both of these devices are incredibly capable and you shouldn't be picking one over the other because of the chip that it has inside of it. They're very similar chips. And what you should really be basing your purchasing decision on is what form factor you like more and what operating system you like more. But I am fully aware of my own bias here because I have used macOS for so long and it's an integral part of my job. I use the Mac more than I use the iPad and for me, it's the system I prefer to use. With that being said, there are certain people where the iPad is gonna be the better device. It is more versatile, it can be configured cheaper, it is more portable, and it has a touch screen that enables a whole slew of use cases that just aren't possible on the Mac. So if you're an artist that draws it doesn't matter how many advantages the Mac has. I can't draw on the screen, so it's a device you're not gonna wanna get. So yeah, like most things in life, there's no clear cut solution for everyone. There's pros and cons to both devices, but if there is one clear cut solution for you, it's that you should get subscribed to the channel because it's free and you made it to the end of the video, so I think I deserve that. But seriously, I really do hope this video helped you out in making a decision between the iPad Pro or the MacBook Pro. And if it did, please give me a like if you wanna see more. Again, make sure you're subscribed and hey, I'll catch you in the next one.